Hi everyone, I'm Hans Almlund and I lead the biological computing section at the intramural branch of the uh, NIH. Uh, I will not talk about nanoparticles today. This will be real-time query and a single particle analysis. And, and it's an honor to be here. It's a great meeting and uh, it's nice to speak right after Shores because as you will see, the method that I'm gonna to introduce to you today is somewhat of a tribute to rely on. And so we developed simple, and uh, that's our package for processing cryo data. We also developed single, which I will not talk about today, uh, that is for structure identification of nanocrystals by a graphene liquid cell. But all of it, this is available on, on GitHub. And it's not only open source, but it's open development. So every, all the work that you see, we do continuous integration on, on a daily basis. So you can follow whatever we are doing in real time. Okay, so this is simple stream, basically an integrated pipeline for real time barium structure determination. We have the microscope producing 500 to 800 movies per hour. That's our Falcon 2. If we cut the exposure, we have a little over 1,000 movies an hour. And as you saw in previous talks, the K2 detector can be used to produce about around 1,000 movies. We then transfer the data off the scope as part of the streaming pipeline to an area where we can uh, do calculations and process the data. The motion correction that we do in simple is very similar to uh, motion core two with a, with a twist in terms of how we regularize the shift trajectories so that you can split the, the motion correction into a large number of patches without, without ruining the solution. And it's optimized CPU code that runs extremely fast. Uh, we also do patch CTF estimation. So you will end up with, with each point on the micrograph having associated the focus values. I have actually worked <laughs> the last couple of years too much time on particle picking. Uh, I will not talk about any of that today, but now uh, the code that we currently have available and, and all of this is available to you guys as well. Uh, you, you just have to input the diameter range and it does everything else for you, including validating the, the, the Gaussian references that are used initially and then automatically updating once class averages are available. And then importantly, of course, for, for streaming is that we start to do single particle averaging because that's the only way that we can validate that the data is of any useful quality in terms of averaging, right? I mean, optical quality, we can look at the ton rings, but we have to start averaging if we are going to provide solid validation in real time. So why do we need real-time single particle analysis? We want to inform data acquisition and improve the image quality through near instantaneous feedback. We want to fail quickly on two challenging samples to prevent waste of microscope and computer time. We want to enable efficient screening of alternative sample preparation and data acquisition methods. And this is becoming increasingly important as we are trying to push the boundaries of what, what we do with this technique in terms of heterogeneity and, and molecular weight sizes. We want to obtain a clean data set from completing the data acquisition so that a high resolution 3D reconstruction can, can be produced directly without tedious additional batch processing. And we want to do all of this, uh, all of the above while dealing with the ever increasing data rates. And so this, is, this unsupervised pre-processing platform is robust and it has been running now for three years at the NCI. Basically everyone that's using the EM platform is using, using this motion correction CTF estimation. We then process these thousands of movies continuously and low quality micrographs are automatically rejected from the pipeline based on estimated tone ring extension. And uh, we have an ice score as well that takes care of too much ice. There's not much to say about that. Picking and extraction, we end up with particle stacks. And then we have the 2D stream analysis. And the idea behind this is very simple. The user defines the number of particles per chunk. The watcher, a watcher launches the nth 2D analysis chunk and junk classes marked here with red dots are, are rejected based on gold standard resolution estimates. And then the next chunk of particles that becomes available is analyzed in the same way, completely independently of the first chunk and the third. And then of course, as uh, Particles classified as good become identified, they are pooled together and refined to create a global solution. And, and already after we have a second chunk, this global solution is created and, and a number of classes are dynamically updated as the process continues. And so the final result is a clean data set that is amenable to high resolution 3D reconstruction. And this is an example of the 2D stream. It's a 250 kilodalton membrane transporter, two-fold symmetric. Here you see what has been rejected in the first subset and then the second subset. And this is the global solution with a lot of classes resolved to below five hours from resolution, lots of classes at intermediate level resolution and then some junk in the global solution as well. And so we want to take this into 3D. Uh, and uh, so we had to put together a little wish list for an Abinitia 3D reconstruction algorithm for streaming. 
it should be able to produce ab initio maps with Helis's resolved so data quality can be directly assessed. It wanted, we want it to be scalable to deal with the increasing data rates and it should be robust, meaning that we find the global optimum most of the time and it should be free of tunable parameters and possible to generalize to heterogeneous samples. And so we have struggled a lot, of, of, uh, put a lot of effort into trying to reconstruct this little molecule, the export gate, pseudo symmetric little bastard. Um, it has no symmetry. It has a pseudo fold fold arrangement of subunits with a sort of a helical twist. It's 300 kilodaltons, of which 100 kilodaltons is disordered detergent. And it's very easy to detect if the Abinitia map is correct, and it's solvable in cryospark. Unfortunately, simple doesn't do a very good job with it. It fails desperately. Even though the class average look okay, it captures the swirls and top views and resolves secondary structure in the side views. The orientation distribution, of course, as you see, is slightly biased to, towards top views and slightly tilted top views. But the, the 3D that we get from the class averages is useless. It's basically just the aspect ratio of the molecule and any refinement attempts on this would simple at least fail. And this is not an uncommon scenario. It's not unique to simple. This happens in all software packages. And what do you do if you have a software package that is black box and, and you don't know what is going on under the hood? while you're stuck, right? So this is basically the essence of my research program, which Shores also touched upon, which is to provide high, high quality open source code for which we can solve real problems that appear in the field. And so the plan of action for resolving this issue was to give up on prior 2D classification and operate directly on the noisy individual particles, because obviously there is a huge advantage in terms of effective signal to noise ratio when you start averaging across the common lines of the data, not only in 2D, right? So give up on the 2D classification. We also decided to give up, and this is the tribute to rely on, to give up on the cross-correlation and use noise normalized Euclidean distance instead as an objective function because it's simply superior. Also, we decided to give up on weighted addition of each particle in many orientations mm -hmm. and decided to assign one particle one orientation. We also gave up on greedy search component in the in-plane, in the optimization of the in-plane degrees of freedom, and we now make probabilistic or soft decisions in each optimization step. And I will tell you a little bit about how that works. And I basically, this is straight before the taxi was coming when I was putting this up on the slide, but um, 10 out of 10 randomly initialized runs converge to an acceptable structure from which you would conclude by looking at it that this data set is going to be possible to reconstruct a high resolution. And that's really the objective of this approach. We don't want to provide the best possible map. We want to have an ab initio reconstruction code that is robust, produces the same result every time, and can give you an, enough information to tell whether this is going to go or not. Right? And the handedness here is ambiguous because I didn't have time to correct it. This is another example of an asymmetric little membrane thing that we did EMPR 10437, no symmetry, 140,000 particles. This is an old friend of ours, uh, HCN hyperpolarization channel from uh, Rod McKinnon's lab. This is mostly because we had processed this several times before with older versions of simples. So we want to see how, how it works now. Yifan, you will recognize this one. And then this is just to, to show that we can do symmetrical structures. And the theory is actually very, very similar to rely on uh, with, with some crucial uh, modifications, right? You look at the rely on reconstruction algorithm or reconstruction equation, and you have this integration over configuration space. This is because rely on assigns each particle image a scalar weight that describes the strength of association of that particle image and the model, which is the, the 3D reconstruction, right? And then, the, and then also the a difference that you see in our equation is that these divisions with the sigma factors are not here. We do have divisions with the sigma factors. We call this ML regularization. I don't know if it's the right term, but it didn't work out as we wanted it. Maybe we implemented it incorrectly, but it didn't work out as we wanted it for this particular ab initio reconstruction stuff that I'm showing you right now. So we have simply just done low pass limited reconstruction for the results that I just showed you. And then what we do, and this is, <clears throat> each image is then assigned an orientation using the following probabilistic orientation algorithm. So what we do, we construct the matrix A, of size n, where n is the number of particles and r is the number of reference central sections. And in our case, it's the polar reference central sections. Each element is then basically the Euclidean distance between the particle image and the reprojection of the volume multiplied by the CTF, scaled by, by the noise variance. Uh, so this is very similar to what, what you see in the equations in Reliant. What we then do is that we take this huge matrix, and this is over the whole data set, right? All particles, all references. We normalize it to get the probability matrix. 
and then we start assigning orientation. So basically what we are doing is that we are using the Euclidean distances not to control averaging, but to control search. So we use the probabilistic model to decide what orientations to assign to the data. And that's the fundamental difference between rely on and, and the way that we have implemented this stuff in simple. And so to put it a little bit further in, in context, basically if we take as an example, projection matching implemented in Eman, Spider, Sparks, or Free Align, we take rely on and we take simple, the type of algorithm that projection matching is an iterative greedy one, uh, rely on is an iterative statistical estimation uh, algorithm. You know, if you look at uh, expectation maximization for Gaussian mixture models, you will, you will f feel like home. Whereas simple is an iterative probabilistic optimization uh, algorithm. So the, the weights are actually used to control the search decisions rather than to control the averaging. And so in projection matching, typically cross correlation is used, whereas we use as rely on and cryo spark noise normalized Euclidean distance. The type of optimization in projection matching is local search. And it's local because for each particle image, we make a decision independent of any other particle image. So we can, in principle, put each particle image uh, in a little box and do it independently of any other particle image. So there's no communication between particles. In, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, uh, there is no optimization in rely on because it's a matter of associating the configuration space with weights and control the averaging. So there's technically no optimization, whereas the optimization in simple is probabilistic. The orientation assignment in, in projection matching is deterministic. Here we are trying to find for one particle image, find one orientation. And it's typically greedy, trying to find the best one. And it doesn't matter really which optimization, or if you use Powell or if you use fancy stuff, uh, it's still going to be local search, right? And it's going to be deterministic and greedy. Rely on is weighted and in a way probabilistic, but not in the way simple as probabilistic, because we are making probabilistic decisions to assign one particle, one orientation. We are not using the probabilities to control the averaging. Search geometry and projection matching is polar for the in-plane rotations and then discrete on the S2. Rely on uses Cartesian central sections, whereas we are using polar central sections just as in projection matching to provide accelerated search. Uh, we are discrete in the in-plane rotations, but we have expressed, you know, based on derivatives of the objective function, continuous, continuous optimization of the origin shift degrees of freedom. And so the optimization strategy in projection matching is to find the projection matching that best matches each image. Uh, whereas in rely on the search, the discretized configuration space is associated with weights and the weighted averages produced in each iteration. Whereas in simple now here, we try to find the particles that are the likely representatives of the, the reference reprojection. So we can't really make any decisions until we have created this huge table of all million particles versus all references. And then we can start making decisions. We can't analyze the data in any arbitrary order. And it's possible to, to provide an embarrassingly parallel which means very effective parallel implementation of, of, of both these approaches, whereas we have to first parallelize the generation of the probability table because it's global and every other particle influences the way that the decisions are made for every other particle. So we can't really do anything until we have the table. The regularization approach that typically used in projection machine is FSC based. And as you saw, Rely on now has FSC based. It has this elegant ML regularization and now these neural network based priors and that we, we will also be excited to test and see how they work. In simple, we have both FSC, we have the ML regularization, and we have implemented CryoSparks non-uniform filter. And so generalization of this, this method um, is pretty straightforward for heterogeneous data. And I should say, I'm getting old, but I've been working with these kinds of algorithms for 20 years now and actively developed uh, methods for dealing with the uh, heterogeneity analysis of particle sorting for 15 years. And, and I was very impressed when uh, Grigoriev, uh, Nico, Nico and, and uh, Limkis published this paper. And actually, I've spent, spent the past 10 years trying to reproduce these results and, and failed. And that's not for lack of trying. But with this new um, probabilistic approach, we, we actually beat Free Align uh, because Free Align fails already at the signal to noise ratio of 0 0.05 to find these uh, specific ribosome conformations. Whereas this, this method that I just introduced to you, when you extend the table over both projection directions and states, finds it. And the way that you can do this, you can do this, you can input, you can decide to generalize to multi-states either in the Abinishi reconstruction step 
you can assume one state or and then you can start splitting the data or you could decide to just fix all the orientations. Yeah, I'm happy with the orientations and, and just extract the states. And this, the next thing is, um, I'm going to show you, is very preliminary. Uh, Cyril, my postdoc, he sent me yesterday. He started to do some benchmarking against CryoSpark. And this is another annoying little membrane protein that Susan Lee loves to work with. Um, and we have struggled with this one too. But, and it's 135 kilodaltons, about 95 of it is, is ordered. This is the 100,000 particles uh, ab initio model from Simple. This is from CryoSpark. This is a CryoSpark model from half a million. And this is CT symmetrization in Simple, followed by a non uniform refinement of those 100,000 particles. And similar for this CLC7. This refinement didn't work out that well because it's just 100,000 particles. I think this one was from one point, uh, yeah, so, um, around a million of particles. So we need to do something, something more about this to get where, where they are getting. But I think it's pretty impressive to get from 100,000 particles that, that level of detail for such a challenging membrane protein. And so the future plans are to develop similar probabilistic algorithms for, for stream 2D analysis and then use our new 2D and 3D and sorting developments to automate cleanup at the particle level as the data is being collected so that you can come home with a clean, clean data set and then couple high resolution non-uniform 3D refinement to the streaming and possibly use, use, use the priors that Charles just, just uh, introduced if we can find that little offline program to apply to the even odd pairs in our iterations. And then finally, I just wanted to mention because Joe Caesar is in the audience. Where are you, Joe? Here, he's over there. He developed NICE, which stands for a new interface for CryEM, which is a web based user interface optimized for remote graphical display. And it's extended to use also rely on in the workflow. And it's automated input output to CryoSpark. So you can stop and start anywhere in the process. It's integrated with the streaming. And it, it's really nice. You can basically run it on your iPad or your iPhone and, and, and it works. Uh, and I want to thank first my guys, Kong is a mathematician that I recruited to my lab. Uh, Cyril has been with me for a long time. He's uh, responsible for streaming, Ryan is postback. Ruben is responsible for the nanoparticle stuff and George is, is our application tester. And then Susan and her group members for their assistance uh, with setting up my lab at the NCI and of course, giving us access to every data set that is being collected at the NCI, which is really nice when you develop code. Uh, and Joe, of course, that developed NICE and also lots of other hardcore low-level stuff related to moving files around and stuff like that. And thank you for your attention.